Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Eye on the Tigers, your favorite place for past, present, and future LSU news. Today, we are going to be having probably one of our favorite guests we've had on this series, and I'm very excited. My name is Bryce. And I'm Reese. And today we have a father, husband, LSU alum, program director for ESPN Baton Rouge, and this generation's voice of Louisiana sports, Matt Moscona. Dang. That that's an intro, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, we're we're excited. Um, this has been a, a long built up interview, not only in our household, but um, we've been talking to to Scone here, and we're really excited. So, um, I know this is one of Reese's favorite media people in general. So, I'll let you cover the first question, buddy. All right. So, we're twenty two and twenty four, fresh out of college. Uh, so, I want to talk about the phase of your life that I would like to refer to as the grind, Scone. <laughs> uh, like, what were your plans of graduating from college? What did you make? What were some major turns in your life to the man we see today? Oh, man. So I don't know if you'll be happy to know, but the the grind scone or the however you said it, that that never stops, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I always knew I wanted to do media. Uh, but I actually when I was in mass comm at LSU, I, I wanted to do news. And um, yeah, I was in school during 9-11, which was very formative. And I think, you know, you're very altruistic when you're young and you think, oh, I'm going to go change the world. And I watched how the media covered 9-11, which was a very, um, obviously very impactful moment in our nation's history. And I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be Peter Jennings, Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw. I want to be that guy. Yeah, I want to be <laughs> the real version of Ron Burgundy. Um, <laughs> but um and I did news for about four years, man. I worked in news radio and got to do some really cool stuff. Um, you know, cur- covered Hurricane Katrina, got to interview former President Clinton on election night in 04. Oh, wow. um, I mean, I, I I got to do some really cool, regardless of what your politics are, that's that's neither here nor there. It's just I, yeah. I got to do yeah. some pretty cool things early in my career. And, um, I mean, after about four years, I just realized I hated what I was doing. And I was about to pivot big time in my career and move to Atlanta and uh, start uh, and run a, a Catholic radio station there. Long story short, that that job fell through, had nothing. Um, Matt Kennedy was the program director of the score 1210 in Baton Rouge at the time, just knew of me, needed a board operator for two days a week, called me, offered me the job. I was like, man, I'm doing nothing else. So, I mean, it was a significant step back career-wise. Um but that was May of 2007. And I think very quickly they realized that I had a, a larger degree of competency than what I was doing. They had a weird one hour gap in programming and it was in the three o'clock hour. And so they asked me and Josh Ennis at the time if we wanted to do a one hour show. Um, and so we did a show called The Fastest Hour. And um, I don't know if y'all remember, but 2007 was a pretty good fall around these parts. Uh, LSU won a national championship and that was my first oh, yeah. season covering the Tigers. And I fell in love with it, man. And so uh, I just never quit covering sports. It was never my intention, but it's it's been, uh, I always tell people, maybe one day I'll grow up and get a real job. But as long as they keep paying me to talk about sports, I'll just do that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That is a dream. And that's why we're here. And uh, we're really excited to talk to you. Yeah, and I kind of want to touch on something that like we do as YouTube. And you've been in radio since before YouTube was this massive thing that it is today. Yeah. You have over uh, 41,000 subscribers on AFR Saints, 26,000 subscribers on AFR LSU, and on your personal channel, you have 16,000 subscribers. What was the hardest switch from radio to YouTube or video? Well, the hardest switch from straight, stri- strictly terrestrial radio to incorporating a video component is theater of the mind goes away. I mean, one of the things I love about radio is theater of the mind. The old adage is they don't know if you don't tell them because they can't see what you're doing. And so a lot of times that allows creativity to blossom. But when you incorporate a video element, a lot of that goes away because there's nothing more left to the imagination. And so now you have to show them. So now whenever I prep a topic, it's no longer just what I'm going to say or what audio elements we want. We're very thoughtful and intentional about what video elements we want to accompany you know, what we're doing. I mean, if you if you look at the at the content we produce, you know, on AFR, our company spent a very large amount of money building that video studio and essentially building out what is like a, a TV news studio with you know, seven cameras in there and 
you know, full-on graphics package, the same graphics package that ESPN uses. The set we use is one that Mike and Mike used to use on ESPN Radio. It's the same set uh, design that they used to use. So it's a massive investment into making it look uh, as good as it's supposed to sound. So it's just a very, it's very different in the way we prepare topics because we have to prepare with a visual component in mind. Yeah, kind of building off of that. Um, you know, you, you evolved from radio to video, but now you've, you've been on video for a long time now. How do you continuously evolve that content to avoid the monotony and, you know, keep your audience members engaged in what you're doing every day? Well, I think the evolution is what we see now in short form vertical. And, you know, obviously that started with TikTok and now everybody's trying to catch TikTok. If it's YouTube shorts or reels and, you know, on Instagram and Facebook. And I, I think, Maybe one of the reasons I've had a lot of success, guys, is because I'm not romantic about any specific platform. Like, I mean, I've been on Twitter X for a long time and done really well. But if tomorrow Elon decides to just burn it down and we all go somewhere else for our our you know, internet, you know, water cooler talk, yeah. I'm going to go there and I'm going to dive in feet first, and I'm going to win there because I just I. I outwork people. I put in the time and the effort. I'm not trying to be braggadocious. It's just absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it like I don't think people really understand. It, that's probably the one biggest misconception is is the amount of work that goes into the product you see. Um, I was compared like in a sports analogy. I mean, the show is like the game. The work is is practice. You know, when guys are practicing five six days a week, they're in the weight room. They're in their film like. That's that's the job. The fun part is on Saturday, or Sunday when you get to go play the game. That's what I, like when the camera, the mic is on. That's the fun part for me. That's just when I get to go deliver and have fun. Um, you know, but I think the most important thing is being willing to evolve. You know, I mean, we saw a moment in media where video, well, the video space was growing, and we had to be there. Otherwise, you go the way of the dodo bird, like. The world isn't going to stop evolving just because you don't want it to, just because you right. want to stay yeah. on radio. So if you want to continue to be relevant, you have to be where everybody is. Guys, when I'll go speak at like at LSU classes or something like that, or, or any, you know, any college or high school, so many people, guys, like the two of you aren't like, aren't even asking me about my radio show. You're asking about YouTube and video. When I go speak at an LSU class, they, people come up to me and go, Oh man, I love your TikTok. I love your reels. Like, no, they don't mention my radio show, but overwhelmingly, guys, if we segmented my audience and how people consume me, overwhelmingly, it's still terrestrial radio. People going into the car, pushing a button to work. listen to yeah. a, an FM frequency in their car. But every year, that shifts more and more digital. And it doesn't yeah. take a rocket scientist to realize, man, if you're not positioned to win in that digital space, then you're then you're you're ultimately going to going to be extinct. So, yeah. you know, to to the question about uh, you know about how it's just you can't be romantic about the way things used to be. You have to be willing to notice shifts in trends and go where people consume. My my thing is I don't care I don't care where you consume me, how you consume me, short form vertical, long form YouTube, radio, podcast. I don't care. Just be there. I'll, wherever yeah. you want, I'll be there. That's that's my that's my whole my whole outlook. That's awesome. Um, I was in one of those classes you spoke to once upon a time, so I oh, remember nice. that. Uh, <laughs> MC 2002 Sports Journalism. I'll never forget it. Man, um, 2002 when I was in school was uh, was sports law mm, uh, back in the day. Anyway, not no, as no, interesting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was media ethics. 2000, I had, Still I had, not I had, as interesting. Had Mike Beardsley for MassCom 2002 with um, media ethics. That's what it was. There we go. No, I, I, I loved that class because every week it was just some new person who we knew from social media and YouTube and the radio coming in to talk to us and have real life conversations. So that was kind of where I first found you. And I've, you know, I've been paying attention to your content ever since. So that's a cool little awesome. connection there. Thank you. Um, but, you know, kind of building on what we just talked about too, like evolution. And, and for us, I know what our daily schedule looks like. I know what we put into our podcast that we have outside of this. Um, you know, whether it's like loading up a Google Doc and just talking or, you know, having a meeting in our living room being like, hey, what do we want to do tomorrow? Um, but what is the, what is the the daily grind like for a three to six daily show? Because for me, three hours daily 
we straight that's a lot. Week. <laughs> like we do an hour a week, and we we have some work to do. So covering the same stuff that you thinking are. about <laughs> thinking about fifteen hours in a week is a uh, is a lot to put on you, and that's not yeah. even including everything else you do, which we'll talk about in a minute. But but what yeah. is that daily process like? Your research, your production, uh, everything that goes into that daily show. So that's evolved too. So whenever I started. My general rule was for every hour that I was on air, I prepped for two. So if I was on a three-hour show, I was prepping for six hours. Wow. Um, now, in many respects also, I was a one-man band. I was, keep in mind, when we launched 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge, I was literally the only employee of the station. So everything was me. You know, we, Cade Wazan was, a, was an employee as well who produced my show at the time. Uh, but had a lot of other roles, but and then I, then the station continued to grow. But um, if I wanted stats, if I needed prep, if I needed audio, if I needed press conference recorded, cut, clipped, that was me. I was doing all of it. Booking guests, it was a hundred percent me. Yeah. yeah. And honestly, I got into that habit for so long that it was very hard because I got so good at my systems and my processes. It was very hard to let go. But the more I've taken on becoming the program director of our station being a husband and a father, um, being a, a, a partner in a, another business, uh, parish construction and roofing. So many other things that have taken onto my plate, the locked on LSU podcast. I do morning scone. We, I'm going to think we're probably talking about some of that stuff, but all that other stuff has, has taken up parts of my day. It's like, if your day is a plate and you're at a buffet, you only got so much room on the plate. You know what I mean? You can't get some of everything at the buffet. You got to pick what you want to do. So it's it's been really important for me to delegate. You know, I got a, a, a really good producer and Matt Musso, who is a an ambitious guy and works really hard. And you know, I've turned over guest booking to him, and you know, he gets me a show prep document every day with topics that you know, he thinks we we might be able to to talk about on the show. There's times where I can literally be like, hey you lead with this. Like we do a segment every day called Tigers and the Pros. It's 100% his. I set it up. He's expected to have it ready to go with sound and video elements and all the things we need. So that that's that's really been what's allowed me to, to do more is by and, and cutting down on, on my personal time in the preparation. It's not to say I don't prep. I still prep a lot. But some of those things had to come off my plate. And so it's important to have really good help. You know, and, and I think as a show grows you get to the point where you can afford all those extra resources yeah yeah and i kind of discovered you in 2019 just listening to the radio on the way to school and on the way back um with like off the bench in the morning esther and henny in the evening and then you right after that um just the, you being the program director at espn baton rouge like you have 11 hours a day that y'all are live, but it never seems like y'all really are stepping on each other's toes. Do, you, do y'all have meetings with everyone to like figure out who's touching what, or is it just how it happens and y'all all just have yeah. different views on the same things? That's a really good question. And actually the fact that you asked it that way is actually very flattering because that's, that's really intentional. Um, because while, because here's the really hard thing when you have off the bench for three hours, Ott and Handy for two, Hunt for two, and then me for three. I mean, when you're going 10 hours live local every day, and generally you're all talking about the same things, yeah. it's very hard to not be repetitive. So I think what we did in building the lineup was while, yeah, we're all local and generally talking about the same topics, the, the vibe, the personality of every show is dramatically different. Like Hester and T Bob are can be really irreverent and fun, but you need that in the morning. Like people are yeah. getting up, they're wiping yeah. sleep out of their eyes, haven't had their coffee, they need to laugh a little. It doesn't, it can't be so serious. Yeah. I think they nail it. You know, Ott and Hanny have been paired together for so long. And obviously, with sports, when sports betting went live, it was very intentional that they skewed more toward a sports betting style of show. Yeah. Um, we've always intended for Hunt to have a co host. And we're very, I'm always looking for who that right person is, but I'm not going to put someone on there just to put someone on there. Right. Um, yeah, but Hunt as a solo show has really good opinions and ideas in the way he addresses things. And obviously I've, I've done my show for a long time. So that's, it's very, very intentional to say, 
yeah, we're all talking about the same stuff, but we're all so different. It should sound like four very, very different shows. So um, if it ever gets repetitive, if it ever feels like we're we're not achieving that end, that's when you have to look at making a change. But I don't think we're at that point. No, yeah. I, I definitely wouldn't say so. I mean, the fact that you can have that 10 hours of daily content and you can differentiate which show is is which and who's who and all the different personalities, that means a lot. Uh, not only to I'm sure everyone over there at ESPN, but but to the people listening in. Um, so obviously, I am the Tigers. We're talking about LSU. I, I mean, I'm a two time graduate of LSU. I'm wearing LSU everywhere. Joe Burrow sitting behind us, and he's a topic of conversation I want to bring to you. This is that fun question I talked about before. So we're huge LSU fans. My time there, I got to see us win multiple national championships. So I want to get your take on this. What championship do you think meant more to the LSU community? 2019 football or 2023 baseball? The 2019 football, just because football is always going to matter more. And not only that, I mean, 2019 football is the greatest college football team ever. So whenever you can stake your flag and say that, like this was the greatest ever at the thing we do, um, that's just, that's always going to, going to rain. Like for me guys, like I was a senior at LSU in 03. Okay. And so I was there for Nick's years. So a lot of, a lot of people hate Nick. I love, I revere the man. Like we, you know, as, and I could say we, I'm an alum. And so just speaking, not from a, a sports media guy, from an alum, like we as LSU fans waited 45 years to see a championship and, I mean, you all are in a little bit of a different, like, you all probably don't remember what it was like to suck. <laughs> LSU no, probably never no. sucked in your life. Fortunately not. Yeah, yeah no, we, great. We didn't um, live before saving. Imagine a life, like, imagine a life where just getting to Atlanta for the SEC championship felt like forbidden fruit. Like, that's Ooh. what it was like, man. And, you know, in 2001, when LSU beat Auburn in a game that was postponed after 9-11, Go to Atlanta, upset number two, Tennessee. I was there, 30, uh, 31 20. I mean, it was an amazing day just to see it. Felt like it felt like it was never going to happen. And so then you, you know, two years later, you win your first national title in 40 in 45 years. Guys, 45 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know how many people lived and died that never got to see it. Yeah. And so for me, like 03 is always going to mean more. It's it will like it just because it was the first for me, it there it will never be topped. But I can I can understand 2019 is the greatest team we've ever seen. Like 2019 would have waxed 2003. As good as that 03 defense <laughs> yeah. was, nobody was going to stop Burrow and those guys from scoring. So, look, I revere LSU baseball guys. I mean, I grew up, you know, when I when I, when we moved to Baton Rouge, born in New Orleans, moved to Baton Rouge in '89. That was the that was the beginning of six straight losing seasons in football, and so the only thing that we had going for us was Shaq. And baseball. So it was <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, I ended up going to baseball games and basketball games because football was so bad in the Hallman era and, you know, the end of Archer and through Hallman. So um, I have a ton of perspective on this and I love LSU baseball and the 2023 championship run was so much fun. My guy, like Tommy White against Wake Forest. We'll, we'll talk mm -hmm. about it forever. You know, Cade Beloso game one against Florida. Like we'll talk about it forever. Ty Floyd, 17 strikeouts. Like, I remember watching Brett Laxton set the record against Wichita State in 93. So I'm with total respect for that. Um, to answer your question, man, 2019 LSU football, for everybody who was fortunate enough to see it, man, I think that can only be equaled, never topped. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was a freshman at LSU working in athletics when that happened. So I thought I was, I thought I was living the greatest life of all time. You were. And, and little did I know that I was right. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, I kind of want to touch on the future, or at least this upcoming season. Uh, after a season of poor defense and great offense for the Tigers and vice versa for the Saints, coaching changes for both teams, uh, what are some things you're looking forward to the most this season? Uh, I don't know. I mean, my answers are probably a little different um, because I think so much now through the prism of of what I need from a media perspective and not so much through a fan's perspective. like. I mean, the fan in me is really hopeful. Garrett Nussmeyer is awesome, and and the defense takes this gigantic step forward. And honestly, so is the media member in me because it's way more fun covering a winning team. Like everybody knows yeah, that. Yeah. 
Um, you know, but I tend to find like on a personal level, like when you start doing this job and you get to know coaches and players a little bit, like you find yourself pulling more for people. Um, you know, so there's guys that I would really like to to see do well. You know, Emory Jones is a kid that went to Catholic High and you know, I got to know him a little bit when he was younger. And I remember speaking at classes at Catholic that he was in and and he just I really pull for that guy. Like I want him to have a great junior year and go be a first round pick. You know, um, th- those are the kinds of things. Um, you know, Jordan Gilbert just transferred in from Texas A and M. Had him in studio, uh, you know, about a month ago or so. And we had a good chance to talk and talk nil and some different stuff. And you know, that's a, that's just a really personable young guy that I, I hope has an awesome year. You know, getting to come back home and play in front of his family. Um. I know that's not the answer you want, but you know, specifically if we're just talking about from an on-field perspective, I want to see the defense go from literally the worst ever, like 108th in the country to like 58th. If you just improve by that much and, and you don't have to be the number one scoring offense in the country, but I mean, if they still go out and average 38 a game, which they're capable of doing, you're going to have a chance to win every game you play. Yeah. So you know, that's that's what I would really, really, really like to see, man. I'd love to, I selfishly would love to see a playoff game in Tiger Stadium. I mean, that would be, can you imagine just guys like that? Like I was talking about the Auburn game in 01. But keep in mind, like that was a de facto SEC West championship game. The winner was going to Atlanta. And so, I mean, you knew in that game, like it was now or never. So there was that playoff type feel to it. And man, like I, to have an actual playoff game in Tiger Stadium is just going to be epic whenever that day. It's going to happen just whenever that day comes. will be awesome. Yeah, that's how I felt about 2019 Florida um, when we were both highly ranked teams. And it, it was that was the game that really tested our national championship future in 2019 for football. And I remember being four rows from the field um, and, and us just being able to solidify ourselves in the history books and then, yeah, you know, Bryce, go on to beat Bama though, and it's different because even if you lost that game, you still weren't done. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like it's different when you know, like when you go this to is the now or never, right? that day and like the game three for LSU in Florida in the national championship, the wake forest game, like every one of those games had a different feel because you woke up that day knowing if you lose your season's over, yep. it's over. And it's just a different feel, man. Like then when you know you have, you, you can, you have another day to play. And so, man, I, look, Florida in 2019 was great. And you're right. You're right about the game, too, because that was the one where you were going to say, all right, this offense, because you remember, like, that offense was crushing that year, and that mm-hmm. Florida defense was going to be the test. Like, all right, if they could do it against Florida, now we're, like, really, really, well, now we get, like, there is no more yeah. test. Like, this right. is it. So I'm with you on that. It's still a different feel, man. Like, they oh, still yeah. watch that game and won the national championship, you know? Um, I I can't even imagine a playoff game. I know the I know the attendance is 102, but it'll feel more like 250 in there. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I, I would feel bad day. for any team having a march into Death Valley. Um, yeah, man. I mean, I'm just I'm excited for this LSU season. Um, I'm excited to see what Garrett Nussmeyer can do after sitting behind, uh, you know, a Heisman winning quarterback last year and Jaden Daniels. Um, and then my my last question: You talk about Tigers on the pros. Um, what are you looking forward to with Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, those guys who are moving on, um, who will finally get to see wearing an NFL uniform? Man, I think uh, so I have a lot of thoughts on X on each of them. I think Jaden went to a great spot. I know Washington yes. has has struggled, but number one, Dan Quinn's the new head coach. So having a defensive minded head coach, he's like Dan Quinn's going to make their defenses good in in Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, he did it in Atlanta when they went to a Super Bowl. He did it in Dallas. Like, and so it's not going to feel like all of the pressure is on Jaden's shoulders. Now they got to get some more offensive skill around him. Um, but also you've got new ownership. I mean, Dan Snyder was a disaster forever. I mean, yeah. You just have a new culture in Washington. So I don't think that's as bad a situation as it would have been, say, a dozen years ago when RG3 went there as the number two overall pick. And it was just he had that that good rookie season and just everything disintegrated around in the rest of his career. Uh, Brian Thomas, I don't know that he could have gone to a better situation. Um, he's sort of a meek, humble guy, 
Jacksonville not being a major market. He's not going to have the immense media spotlight on him. And he will become, he will become Trevor Lawrence's best receiver. And he is going to annihilate the NFL because you just don't see many guys built like that, that run like that. He's going to be awesome. And then Malik is made for New York. Like Malik neighbors is the guy we'd go out at practice and he's the guy that would make a catch over a teammate. And then he would stand over his teammate, let him know how much better he is than his teammate. Like yeah. He is made, made for the bright lights in New York City. Now, I don't know if Daniel Jones can can get him the football, and that's a problem. That's but that is an issue. But maybe in this draft, if the Giants draft whoever Daniel Jones's replacement might be, you know, maybe that becomes easier with a guy like Malik there. But I mean, those three, I think all of them went. To, it's not always the case, man. Guys don't always get drafted to a great situation. I think for each of them individually the situation they went to is is a really really solid fit yeah i'm really excited and and speaking on malik neighbors specifically with daniel jones being able to get him the ball i think my favorite part about malik neighbors though is what he does after the catch anyway so if daniel jones can at least put it in a place where he he gets his hands on it um he'll make something special in new york brian thomas i remember watching him when he was at walker and i was like oh he's gonna be good and then he goes to lsu and then we get to watch him evolve from this guy who's getting 45% 45% of the snaps to getting picked in the first round. And then yeah. uh, Jaden Daniels, known Jaden Daniels hater sitting to my side, but uh, definitely turned around on turned him around, after he around. saw him win that Heisman Trophy. Um, oh, man. The, I, the, uh, the 22 season with all the Jaden haters, man. I, I was in on Jaden early, man. When everybody wanted to see Miles Brennan, I was like, hey, look. Oh, that wasn't that far. They, I said, look, they, they <laughs> didn't go get Jaden Daniels to, to let him sit. Like right. they didn't go get him for him to watch. Yeah. They knew what they had or didn't have in in Brennan at the quarterback position. And quite honestly, that offensive line in 2022 was so atrocious. Like, do you remember Garrett Dellinger started the opener against Florida State? Like, yeah. it was yeah. so bad that you had to start two freshmen. Now they became awesome players, but that line was so bad that Jaden running for his life became an integral part of your offense. Right. Then True. in 2023. It became okay. Now, now you're, now you got something, and Jaden's running ability became a massive part of your offense, which is part of why he won the Heisman. But um, no, man, anybody that blamed Jaden for whatever was wrong with LSU, my goodness, I mean, his ability to protect the football in 22 is why you didn't self implode. Um, his ability to run and escape pressure behind an anemic offensive line is why you kept drives alive. Then the first play of that season, go if you remember, go back and watch the first play of the game. You remember the first play of the game against Florida State in the dome? The very I don't first remember play. it. I was driving to work. J- bro, Jaden, Florida State breaks through the line. Jaden's about to get uh, in, like inhaled by a, by the defense. He zips through and runs for twenty five yards around left end, and then boop, throws a completed pass. You're in the red zone. And then the third play through it into the end zone to to Kayshawn, which. Got his hands on, probably should have caught it. But in that drive, they ended up, um, they had the field goal blocked on that drive. It was the errant snap or whatever it was. But um, yeah. a lot I mean, of special teams errors in that. They kicked the field goal there to go up 3 nothing. But anyway, point being, like from the very first play of the season, you realized, okay, that's why he's playing. Because your offensive line stinks and he can make something out of nothing. There we go. There we go. Um, yeah. I, and the best part about LSU, too, is the future. I mean, you look at 2025 and it's, the guys who are coming in um, is going to be something spectacular. So, I think twenty five and twenty six. Like, yeah, yeah I'm upper crop in the state in twenty six. And every guys, if y'all go back and look at every championship team, there's always that that recruiting class where the state of Louisiana produced a bumper crop. Even you go back to the 03 championship, Marcus Spears, Michael Clayton, Marquise Hill, Andrew Whitworth, Rudy Nicewanger. I mean, you had these guys that were the cornerstones of the 03 championship team that all signed and played together in 2001. So whenever you get a class like that and they all stay home, like you look at 26, you can go, oh man, if all those guys stay home, we got like seven guys in the top 50 in the country, like yeah. three in the top 15. You get all those guys to stay home. Yeah, man. Like you're, you just like start, start printing the new, you know, the, the new flag, the new championship. Like I guess it's coming. It's be a matter of, is it 26, seven, eight? I mean, it's coming. So, yeah, we won't have to wait another 45 years for another one. That's for yeah. sure. No, I, I don't think, I don't think so. I think, I think those days are probably, you know, knock on Formica, probably gone. Yeah, there we go. 
Uh, I mean, this has been this has been a fantastic time. It's it's good getting to talk to you. Not only because you're one of the best media members that Baton Rouge has, but you're just great guy, father, husband. We we got to talk about um, that situation a little bit before we press record here, and I'm I'm glad we did just because not only you are you a great representation of what LSU media members should be, but you're a great representation of what a man should be, uh, especially in today's society where we never know what we're gonna get. Hey so, man. Um, Dude, being a dad, being Drew's dad is the best job in the world, man. That's every day I lay down, lay my head on my pillow. And if you ask me, hey, what was, what was the best part of your day today? I would tell you something with him every day. So That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's fun. It. I'm surprised, genuinely surprised he didn't run in here during the interview. The, the door to my office is open. I thought for certain he was going to come in here at some point. We came close a couple times. I could hear the pitter-patter of his feet by my door. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't let, he didn't break the threshold. I think that would have been the exclamation point on, on one of our favorite interviews, if not our favorite interview we've done on Eye and the Tigers. You know what else? Why, wow, guys, when y'all started, you, when you said like, I don't even know if you intended to say it, but you said like the voice of a generation. Um, I guess that just means that I'm getting old. <laughs> but it's wild to think, man, that um, that I've done this for as long as I have now. And those guys have done it way longer than me. But you know, I'm 42 now, and I, I started AFR in 2010. I was 27 years old at that point. Um, I don't know that I, I don't know what I ever intended, guys. Like I don't know if I ever intended to do this job this long. And you know, people ask me like, are "You ever going to move? Or are you ever going to stop?" And like, I don't know the answer to that, man. Like, I, you know, I've had opportunities to leave. I've had some big market opportunities, but um, you know, I, I work for great people. I get to talk about teams I love. I make a good living. My family's here. So I don't know, man. I mean, if if tomorrow everybody decides my show stinks and nobody listens anymore, I don't know. I'll go like I'll go load bananas on a truck or something. I'll be good. But in the meantime, I uh, I'm very very fortunate to do what I do. So I don't know. I'm rambling a bit, but that just kind of no, hit me when I said that. And, I, and maybe it's just a thought to say like I'm very uh, very grateful to be able to do what I've I've done for as long as I have, and I'm always very sincerely grateful for for the audience because like this isn't pandering. I mean I mean it sincerely. I, I'm sure you guys understand it as well with your show. You will if you don't, but. Like without people that listen, there's Drew. <laughs> yes. Uh, without like seriously, without people that listen, like I'm just a guy in a room talking. Yeah. And there's nothing you can ever do to make someone like your show. It's almost like a like a like a musician. You put out your music, but you can't make people like what you do. They either do or they don't. And so like I'm very much at peace with that. Like if I love what I do, I'm fortunate to do it. But if people decided you stink. We're not listening anymore. Okay. Like everybody has their day and I'll move on and do something else. But all that to say, I'm just very sincerely grateful and humbled whenever people choose like to listen or to watch, you know, my show because they, people have options and it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a very, very cool thing when you have that kind of relationship with your audience. So I'm very grateful. So thank you guys. Yeah. I use that term just because like off the bench in the morning, that's kind of like a player's perspective almost. And then like, you have guys that like specialize in like baseball, like mic'd up. And I feel like you're just like the jack of all trades and every, like you're the, at least in my eyes, the most followed out of the guys in the ESPN studio and LSU it's, uh, sports media in general. And so, like, yeah, I mean, you, you are absolutely the voice of Louisiana sports. But yeah. I mean, f- well, for me, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. doesn't matter to me. Uh, neither one of us played past high school. So we hear you, but um, yeah, for me, I mean, if you ask anybody in Baton Rouge, who's Matt Moscona, they're going to know the name. And and that's what it means to me is that you don't have to be this nationwide recognized guy. For me, it's most important of who's talking about the teams that I love and are they talking about things that I care about? And you check off both of those boxes quite easily. Um, So it's, it's awesome to be able to listen to you every single day and and observe your content, but also get to talk to you um, in in a setting like this. Thanks. So, Bama yeah, we, fans we know who I am now. I don't oh, absolutely. Boy, they boy, they know who yeah, I am absolutely. now. <laughs> and they need to remember too. Um and and they won't forget it, I don't believe. But uh yeah, I, I really appreciate you doing this. And as two guys who, you know, get do our own show and and for us, it's kind of like you said, it's for it's for the love of it. I mean, we love what we do and and we appreciate everyone who listens, but you know, whether it's one person or a hundred thousand people, I I, I love what I do. I love getting behind the microphone and being able to talk about the things that I love and, and the people that I love to do it with. So um, we really appreciate you getting on and, and being able to do this with us. Awesome guys. Congrats on your success. Happy to do it anytime. Okay. 
Appreciate you very much. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching Eye on the Tigers. I'm Bryce. And I'm Reese. And we were talking to Matt Moscona, the generational talent <laughs> with the LSU Saints and everything Louisiana sports. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time.